Welcome to Lesson 3 of Module 2, The Organisation of Living Things. This is Part 1 of a three-part series uh, on autotrophs. In this video in particular, we're going to be looking at uh, structures at a macroscopic level, so those which we can see unaided, so with the naked eye. So when we talk about autotrophs, we're really talking about them in comparison to heterotrophs, and they're based into two categories based on the requirements that they have for energy. Autotrophs make their own energy by converting inorganic matter to organic compounds. They're also called producers because they produce all the organic compounds that we find in any ecosystem. And then in comparison, we have our heterotrophs, which obtain any organic compounds by consuming autotrophs or other heterotrophs. And these ones are also called, so called consumers as they can sh consume organic compounds. So just like we said, autotrophs uh, can be divided into this category because they do make their own food uh, from inorganic molecules from their environment. We can then break these autotrophs into further categories based on exactly how they obtain the energy required for carbon fixation. And those two groups are photosynthetic autotrophs, so those which use light energy, and then there's chemosynthetic autotrophs, and these use chemical energy uh, to fix carbon. When we talk about phototrophs, we're actually talking about plants or autotrophs that use solar energy to produce organic compounds. Um, one example are the green plants, which we know, uh, and that's because they have chlorophyll molecules that absorb different amounts of light at different wavelengths. There are a range of chlorophyll molecules, not only the green chlorophyll pigment, which can absorb different amounts of light uh, based on different wavelengths. On the other hand, we have chemoautotrophs, which obtain their energy by the oxidation of inorganic molecules, um, including ammonia, nitrate, and sulfate. And by breaking these down into other ions, it allows them to use this for the ability to fix carbon. And these kind of organisms do live in more extreme environments, and they're what we referred to previously as extremophiles. So one lot of the macroscopic structures are our root system and these play a vital role in anchoring our plant to the soil. We can see here on the right that there are some variations of roots uh, and one is the taproot and one is the fibrous root. We can see that they go to varying depths and widths based on the requirements of the plant. Uh, these play an important role in also absorbing water and minerals from the soil and this allows them to photosynthesize. Some of the roots can also store glucose, which is produced by the plant. Because of their small structure, they have a large surface area, which increases the rate of absorption of water and those minerals from the soil. Um, and like I said, it's because of these small root hairs and that branching structure that they have. Internally, roots have a few different um, layers, a few different structures, which allow them to complete their functions. So we have the epidermis, which is the protective outer layer. We then have the cortex, which is the storage area for excess materials, but it also um, provides some space where uh, gases can circulate. And then we have the vascular tissue, which forms a cylinder in the center there, that kind of X-like structure in um, figure 2.47. And this contains xylem and phloem, which we're going to look at at more detail uh, in one of the coming videos. Another structure is the stem, and this is the structural axis of the plant. And the stem has nodes and internodes, and nodes is where um, it can hold leaves which go into branches, and then internodes are the structures which distance one node from another. The function of the stem, like we said, is to support um, not only the trunk of the tree or the plant, um, but to allow the leaves, flowers, and fruits to elevate off the ground. It also uh, performs a function of transporting fluids from the roots and the shoots um, and then through the xylem and phloem which does move all the way up the stem. It does store nutrients and it is the production site of the new living tissue. We can then look at the leaves here um, and these are again visible to the naked eye and we can see here on the right that they do have the lamina which is the blade of the leaf and then the petiole which joins the leaf to the stem. The way in which they're arranged on the stem uh, allow them to expose themselves to maximum sunlight, as we know that light is required for photosynthesis. Uh, the best kind of structure for achieving a large surface area um, for that sunlight and for gas exchange is if they are broad, uh, thin, and flat. 
Internally, a leaf looks like the picture here on our right, and we have the cuticle, which allows it to maintain its shape and provide protection. Again, we have some epidermal cells, which are a single layer of cells um, and transparent, and it allows the sun to penetrate into um, the cells that contain the chlorophyll molecules. Uh, we have stomates, and these are little pores which open and close for gas exchange. The mesophilia uh, contains the cells which have chlorophyll, um, which is where our gas exchange and photosynthesis takes place. And then we have our veins, which are tubes of vascular tissues which run through the leaf. Here we can see another diagram here. So this is a microscope picture of our epidermal cell, um, cells on the upper and lower side. And then we have our parenchyma cells, which form that middle layer. And our final structure is the stomata, and these are crucial in gas exchange. They allow um, an air space to open, which is uh, open and closed by what we call a guard cell. And depending on whether they are open or closed will depend on the amount of gas exchange and transpiration that will occur in the leaf. That is part one of lesson three. Make sure you tune in for part two.